In 1972, when Brian's first record with Roxy Music was released, um, one critic uh, on the British music press described it as the best debut album ever. Um, it wasn't just the music, however, that was considered so innovative and so magical and so haunting and so erotic and so exciting. It was the packaging of the record. It was the cover. It was the album artwork. And the same critic, who was called Richard Williams and was a great early supporter of Roxy Music, described Brian's vision as a visual artist in terms of how he packaged the music, how he made the band look, as being nothing short of a manifesto and he told me once that the impact of that record and its cover was quite extraordinary. Was it difficult for you to decide when you were an art student, when you were a young man, between your passion for painting and for art and your desire to become a musician and a singer? I, I'd been a music f fan from the age of 10. I was really obsessed by music from a, a very early age. Um, yeah, gradually the, you know, the art thing uh, became you know, the focus of my life you know, from about mm. the age of 18, I guess. And uh, later on, after I left Newcastle, I got my degree, and so I was a qualified <laughs> artist, as it were. And then I moved to London, and uh, the nagging thing was always, oh, can I do something in music? I wasn't really sure. As, as much as I loved it, I wasn't sure I had any talent, and I, I'm still quite unsure. <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, while I was at college, actually, I'd done some singing in a band. Mm -hmm. But the, the, it was all kind of covers of all the kind of records that we liked. Um, people like Bobby Bland and quite obscure R&B, uh, rhythm and blues people. I don't know, I just thought, well, maybe I could do something which fused my interests you know, mm. in uh, creativity, uh, in art, mm. with writing songs. And um, so I started writing these songs and trying to put together a band. And um, I was very, very fortunate to, uh, to uh, have some great people who I kind of gradually pulled into my orbit. And, um, mm including you know, Andy Mackay, who was the, really the kind of first person in the band. He was uh, interesting. Uh, through Andy, we, um, we, I met uh, Brian Eno, who came to, came to our, the house where we were kind of working in London uh, one day with a huge um, tape recorder to, because <laughs> this was, before cassettes were invented, or any of the kind of amazing machines we have now. And so he, his tape recorder is about the size of this table, as heavy, <laughs> and he sort of lugged it into the room, and he recorded us, and then he decided to, he stayed, and mm. thank goodness. And uh, for two years we worked together, two or three years. Well, as soon as we started um, playing live in a very small way to begin with, in, in rooms like this, mm -hmm. um, we started thinking about, well, how should we represent ourselves, you know, visually? Um, so Anthony helped me do that. He had this mo beautiful model he was uh, working with at the time called Carrie Ann Muller, mm -hmm. and uh, she was the star of our album cover. Mm -hmm. And uh, the photograph uh, was taken by Carl Stoker, mm -hmm. And um, and I was there, kind of bumbling around, kind of uh, trying to get what I wanted, really. Mm. And, but they they were found indispensable and uh, very important in creating that first image. Mm. Mm. To this day, the cover to Country Life, which was the fourth Roxy Music album, um, it remains one of the most risque and controversial and confrontational images on a record sleeve. 
um, and yet it also remains completely modern and its ability to seduce never seems to dim. Um, could you tell us how that sleeve came about? Uh, I took Eric Bowman and Anthony Price both mm. to uh, Portugal. So I thought, well, we're running very late behind time with the deadline and uh, I'm writing the lyrics and uh, about to sing the song. I had a few days to do that when I got mm -hmm. back. Um, I said, let's try and do the cover while we're out there and uh, this time do it on location. So we went to a bar one night, as one does. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> who was I? I was with Simon, Simon Puxley was there mm -hmm. also, who was, um, we called him the doctor. He was a, a doctor of philosophy. He was uh, one of the key people in, the, in Roxy Music. He mm -hmm. was like my very, very close friend and uh, advisor in a way. And I, I'd always ask his opinions about everything mm. and uh, especially uh, lyrics because he, he, mm. he was a writer himself and um, very, very clever. Sadly, no longer with us. Um, anyway, we went to this bar and uh, we met these two beautiful German girls um, who um, it turned out how, were very closely related to the German group Can, ah. which Simon was a great friend of. He actually produced one or two of their uh, records. Mm. And uh, so there was uh, the sister and the girlfriend of, of the band. Um, mm. And uh, so we just said, you know, would you like to be a, you know, <laughs> on an album cover? We, we, we've got to shoot it uh, tomorrow. And, uh, mm. and so they said, yeah, great. And, um, so there we went off into, into the undergrowth the next day. <laughs> and uh, I think for lighting, we used a car's headlights. Mm -hmm. So that was, um, mm. the idea was to, to, um, to, to have this shot of these two girls, you know, mm. um, kind of some sort of story of there. What, what have they been? What are they doing? Mm. You know, and why are they there? And caught mm. in the glare of the um, headlights of this mm -hmm. car. My, my son actually was a friend of Kate, uh, Kate Moss. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he asked her if she'd love, and she said, oh, I'd love to. I've always wanted, wanted to be a Roxy girl. Uh -huh. And uh, so that was great. She, we got the, uh, the great thing about Kate, as well as being a great, beautiful looking woman, you know, and, is that, uh, and obviously with a great career in um, a million magazines she's launched. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> She's also got a great kind of edginess and rock and roll history. She's quite notorious, uh, mm -hmm. and she's a bit mad, bad, and dangerous to know kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I thought that would be perfect for the Olympia image, you know, because mm -hmm. the Manet's painting in 1863, and mm -hmm. when he painted it in 65, when it was exhibited, um, I think, um, caused quite a sensation in Paris mm -hmm. because the woman was kind of. She wasn't nude in an academic, uh, mm. like an academic way. She was kind of naked, you know, and uh, it was quite different. She's wearing jewelry and shoes, and she looked like a lady of the night, you know, mm. with, with her maid and cat and flowers and this. And, and I thought, well, that's a great start. And mm. so that was our departure point. <laughs> thank you. And thank you.
It's very amusing for me, uh, you know, to look back occasionally. And, uh, uh, it's not every day I get to see pictures you know, from way back through the archive. And uh, yeah, it's, a, it's quite interesting to have a, a pictorial survey of the th things we've been doing over the years. You know, um, 
as I always say, the music is the uh, is the main message of of, of my work. But uh, we've always tried to make it interesting visually, you know. And um, so yeah, it's it's good to see the photographs from the past together with the um, album covers that we've made over the years. It is very much a family business at the minute. It's um, it's great to have the uh, the kind of unbridled enthusiasm of youth, you know, surrounding one. And um, both in my office, my studio in London, and in my band, it's great to have this young energy, uh, together with the kind of um, more mature musicians I have also. Uh, it makes a very well balanced kind of. Um, uh, group of people, and uh, it's great having Isaac, uh, who is a, quite an accomplished film editor, uh, who worked with Mario Testino, the photographer, for a couple of years. That's for, where he did his uh, his uh, had his education really in photography, and uh, so it's great to have somebody who shares my visual interests, you know, from the family. It's incredible. Uh, Tara is. Um, Another one of my sons, who, as you say, has, uh, has um, done the campaign with me. And uh, it's extraordinary seeing all these kind of billboards everywhere around London and here in Berlin, even. Nowadays, it can be considered you know, cool to, to endorse a brand like that, whereas even 10 years ago, it was quite different I think um, and I, I guess the music business has grown up quite a lot over the years and um, it n now accepts um, that kind of thing you know which in the past would have been seen as uh, selling out or something and now it, it, it's it's considered you know, kind of an intelligent thing to do and, and a big fan of Berlin also I mean, it's, I love coming here, and uh, there's always a kind of, a kind of, I don't know, intellectual curiosity here, which is kind of married with a kind of element of um, edginess, which I think is always very good. Uh, it's a shame that I didn't do that, but uh, there's always a future. <laughs> um, yeah, it was always kind of pretty much tied to London for my, my recording um, work, um, except a few things in America as well. Um, but uh, no, it would be nice to come here. Well, as I said earlier, it's great to be um, surrounded by young people um, in my work. and. Uh, I think it's it's always good to have a you know a blend of maturity, and and you know, the excitement that comes with youth and and people doing it for the first time. And I think the band illustrates that. Uh, it's uh, but you're talking about the bigger picture, and I don't know. I I think I've reached the position in my career where I'm not really affected by what goes on elsewhere. You know. Um, there was a, a period, well, I think, where, when it was much worse, um, the ageism thing, you know. Um, I think now I've reached such a grand old age that it's kind of immaterial. <laughs>
I really don't know what's going to happen tonight. I think it's uh, uh, one of these very classy uh, Brian Ferry big orchestra events. That's all I know. I'm, I'm, I'll, uh, I'll let myself be surprised. And always looking good, Brian Ferry, right? He's a, a, a very, very uh, well-dressed man, and he understands, like nobody else, the art of the radical understatement in elegance. I have a story to tell, actually, because when, when I was like, 10 or 12 or something, I was uh, sitting at home in the living room with my dad and we were taping the West German radio, like songs from the radio, because my dad had a band and uh, they were like looking for stuff to play. And I really remember we just taped Avalon and the band played it, you know. So I went to the rehearsal room and I remember the song. And I was just, when they played the song, I wrote my dad a message. I was like, hey, I'm at the Brian Ferry concert. He plays this song. And this is like, it's my, my childhood memories, it's crazy. No, it's fantastic dances, the visuals obviously, I mean Brian Ferry is obviously, uh, you know, a fine artist, so he, with all the covers and stuff, we were yesterday at the launch of the exhibition at the HBC, which was fantastic as well, so he did an interview, and that was really great.